How do we visualize the internal? Artists have been trying to depict mental illness or at the very least mental anguish for hundreds of years now. These depictions sometimes portray treatment. Other times they've used abstract or fantastical imagery to depict the experience of mental illness. Sometimes artists simply do portraits of real people with mental illnesses. Sometimes they're even self-portraits. Does the artist want the viewer to see the beauty in the suffering or do they want them to feel uneasy? Are we looking at someone who is mentally ill or are we looking through the eyes of someone who is mentally ill? In this video, we'll be looking at the history of mental health on the internet, from romanticized self-harm Tumblr graphics to the sad girl TikTok aesthetic, and asking if all of this is leading to a dangerous glamorization of serious issues or if it might also have the potential to be used for good. Just before we dive in, I want to thank today's sponsor, Book of the Month. They are a book subscription service where you can discover the best new and upcoming authors because the editorial team will curate a selection of books for you to pick from across a bunch of genres. Just make your selection and a few days later, one of these beautiful boxes will be with you with your book inside. You can also get backlist titles at a discount if you want to have like an add-on book. If you are a voracious reader and will get through more than one or you want to get a bookish gift for someone else. My choices for October were The Leftover Woman by Jean Kwok, which is a thriller which is described as emotionally poignant, which I kind of love, about these two women who are separated by like everything from economics to culture, but who both have a very intense and special relationship with this one child. And then I also chose to get The Fragile Threads of Power by V.E. Schwab because I've heard really amazing things about her work, but I haven't read any yet. But this is a standalone which is set in the same fantasy universe as some of her other books. Using their subscription means that you'll end up paying less than you would elsewhere for the newest hardbacks. And you can also take part in their loyalty program for extra perks on top of that. Plus, you can rate and review the books and take part in reading challenges alongside other readers on their app. They've recently launched curated audiobooks too, and I very much am an audiobook girly, so I'm definitely going to be checking that out because you can pick and listen directly in their app. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, then visit bookofthemonth.com to pick your first book and join today. And you can even get your first book for $5 using the code SPOOKY right now. Mental illness isn't usually observable in the same way that physical ailments might be. If I asked you to draw someone with chickenpox, for example, you would draw someone covered in red spots. If I asked you to draw someone with anxiety or schizophrenia, it might be a bit more difficult, perhaps relying on a symbolic cloud over their head or an accompanying description of their inner thoughts. When we talk about the aesthetics of mental health, I think a lot of people probably have an image of a 2000s black and white Tumblr post or a sad girl artist music video or a TikTok of a tragic suicidal movie character edited over longing piano music. The idea that we have glamorized mental health, that we've commodified it, that we've made it into a mere aesthetic in the age of the internet, but that's not new. But what does feel new, to me at least, about the latest wave of mental illness visuals is the sheer quantity and how it's presented to us. It's never ending. On TikTok alone, the mental health tag has over 104 billion views, whereas in years gone by, you might have to be actively searching to find the side of Tumblr with romanticized depression edits. Now, a wider public opening up around mental health, combined with the ever-increasing trend of creating full-on aesthetics for every internet subculture and community, means mental health imagery has never a bit more widespread. In this video, I want to take a step back, sift through this content and try to figure out if all of this is helping or just causing more harm. Part one, the aesthetic. So it's time to define some terms so that we know what we're talking about here. Everyone has mental health in the same way that everyone has physical health. But in this video specifically, I'm using the phrase mental health often interchangeably with mental health issues or mental illnesses or disorders. Mental illness, much like physical illness, is an incredibly wide category and encompasses a wide variety of disorders and severities. And that variety is going to be key to discussions later in the video. When talking about mental health online and in campaigns, I feel like there is often a focus on anxiety and depression, but that isn't the end of the story. We also have things like OCD, eating disorders, bipolar, borderline personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder, PTSD, trauma in a very wide encompassing sense that can't necessarily be diagnosed with a very specific single mental health condition. I think that anxiety and depression get mainstream for a number of reasons, maybe due to the prevalence of them, maybe due to the ways in which they parallel kind of ordinary or typical experiences, 
it's not that being depressed is just being sad, but people who have never experienced it will probably find it a little bit easier to understand what depression might feel like in comparison to something like psychosis, which is so removed from so many people's experiences if they haven't suffered from it. Other important terms for this video are aesthetic and aestheticization. Now, if we look at the old school dictionary definition, we find this, aestheticize, to represent as beautiful or artistically pleasing, to represent in an idealized or refined manner. But more recent use of the word, particularly on the internet, is tied to online subcultures and micro trends. You want your style to be the coastal grandma aesthetic or goblin core aesthetic, or have your TikTok content take on the aesthetic editing style of other users you admire, or utilize the aesthetic of in-group memes to heighten your communication style and humor. And these aren't always joined with traditional ideas of beauty. Rather, it's a visual language that ties imagery together. Aesthetics often smooth out the rough edges of reality. Take cottage core for example. That is an aestheticization of rural spaces. But we know that real life doesn't look like that. There are bugs and grass stains and mud. That misrepresentation, however, isn't that big of a deal in this case, because I think most people watching these videos know that they're watching an idealized image. If aestheticization is a specifically narrowed representation, then aesthetics are the rules of that interpretation. So the aesthetics of cottage core would be things like pastoral imagery, pastel color palettes, and a visual emphasis on things being done by hand. As these communities form around aesthetics, the aesthetic can start to take on a deeper meaning. For some people, the cottage core movement represents an anti-capitalist utopia of sorts, a queer rural future that's driven by sustainability and pleasure rather than profit. But for others, cottage core represents a return to the good old days where women stayed at home and made bread, I guess. This is one of the dangers of an aesthetic first community. An aesthetic can be interpreted a thousand different ways. What's inspirational to one viewer can be disempowering to another. And obviously when it comes to mental health, that variety of interpretation has some pretty dangerous potentials. Part two, the aesthetics of suffering. It is vital in this discussion to separate the different focuses these types of posts take. The most controversial is the kind that seems to romanticize, aestheticize or glamorize the suffering itself. An often cited image that crystallized this at the height of 2000s depression Tumblr is this photo edit. The text reads, I think suicidal people are just angels that want to go home, across a black and white photograph of a girl with her head in her hands. The image itself is artistic, but the words are the most impactful part here. The religious imagery, the connotations of purity and virtue, the inevitability. There's this conflation of mental illness and suicidal ideation with a worthy identity of suffering as some kind of preordained, foregone conclusion. And this angelic reference wasn't confined to this single post. Journalist Nadja Brennison investigated a trend on German-speaking Instagram in 2015, where young people who identified as Suze, shorthand code for suicidal, shared posts of the word angel written on their wrists using the hashtag respect for suicide angels. In the article she wrote, in my attempt to understand even the tiniest fraction of their reality, this time around I spoke to a Sue who asked to remain anonymous. So let's call her Leandra. Leandra started by explaining what respect for suicide angels meant. In our eyes, everyone who commits suicide becomes an angel. If your whole life was spent in hell, you belong in heaven. We envy those girls for having the courage to do what we all want to do but we also respect them for bearing so many years before ending it all. Obligatory platitudes like they're at peace and she's one of God's angels now aren't uncommon when talking about someone who has died, but they feel like banal pleasantries, things that you say to lessen the grief of someone in the face of an unjust tragedy. The respect for suicide angels hashtags framing of death on the other hand feels very different. Thinking about someone as an angel is a cause for jealousy and shame. There's an understandable sentiment here, right? A reaching for a higher purpose in their suffering that's expressed as a conviction about a better existence beyond this one. It's comforting in a way, but it's also obviously dangerous. Renison spoke to a youth psychiatrist for her article called Frank Conline, who said, young people who are already fragile and perhaps already have experience with self-harm could be massively stimulated by this sort of thing and encouraged to self-harm again. When self-harm is glorified, or as in this case, put into an almost religious context so that it is evaluated positively, the risk is particularly high. This kind of post from Tumblr is the sort of asceticization that I'm used to from my teenage years. But I think that the current wave is less virtue-based and often centers around beauty in many ways instead. On TikTok, there's a plethora of sad girl videos, desaturated edits of pretty women crying while Lana Del Rey or Billie Eilish plays in the background. 
text of these videos might communicate despair, but the visuals always communicate a specific type of beauty. The sort of wide-eyed, long-haired, skinny, usually white girl. It's like a perfume commercial for sadness. And there's an understandable fear around these trends, which has been there for decades now, that conflating attractiveness with despair makes despair seem tempting, if not outright desirable. The idea of mental health crises, including suicide, having an element of social contagion to them is not a new worry. One study in 2013, for example, by Hefel and Hames, found college students who were exposed to depressive thinking from the randomly assigned roommates during the first three months of the term were twice as likely to develop depressive symptoms as those who were not. A year later, an experiment experiment by Kramer, Guillory and Hancock compared how this might work online in comparison to the more intense and intimate roommate setting. They found that being exposed to more negative posts from friends on Facebook was linked to an increase of negative posting by the users themselves. It's part of the reason that reporting on suicide has such strict journalistic guidelines advised by charities and unions. There is a fear that irresponsible reporting which sensationalizes the story could increase the chances of others' mental health worsening. This isn't necessarily necessarily tied to who is closest to the person who died, but who might be most struggling or vulnerable in that moment within the radius of the reporting. One of the key pieces of advice given out by medical professionals around protecting young people after the suicide of a peer is not suggesting suicide is an understandable response to difficult feelings. We can see how the language and attitude of many online posts around mental health do the exact opposite of this. Journalist Anne-Sophie Bine conducted an interview with a 16-year-old Tumblr user Laura back in 2013 around the pull of these types of images, saying she pined to be mysterious, haunted, fascinating, like the other people her age, in black and white photos with scars along their wrists. With Laura herself acknowledging that she was what she referred to as just wanna be depressed, seeing this as something to aspire towards rather than the expression of something she was already feeling internally. YouTuber Olivia Sun made a video essay about the desire to be sad in which she reads entries from her own diary full of lies exaggerating her own sadness in her own private fantasy of being that girl. She never intended to share her writings with anyone, yet the desire to be sad and interesting and deep prevailed in her private diary. And I think this is an interesting counter to this prevalent idea that young girls especially are talking about mental health as a way of getting attention. It feels like an extension of the tortured artist myth, the idea that to produce beautiful art, music or poetry, you need to be someone familiar with suffering. People romanticize artists who die young, who struggled, whose lives were cut short. It isn't necessarily the understanding that mental illness absolutely gets in the way of being able to function, that getting access to art is not a form of payoff for an individual suffering, and that maybe these people would have produced just as wonderful creations for many more decades if they've been able to. This sense of aspiration towards mental health struggles finds a home in countless places online. So-called pro-ana or pro-anorexia content is rife and has been for years, along with encouragement of any number of other self-harming behaviors and disorders. Writer Ruby Staley has spoken about how posts on Tumblr, which were particularly focused on the desirability of suffering, became an influential part of the draw for her. There were tips for hiding an eating disorder from your family, how to burn off more calories than you consume, and at the peak of it, fat phobic rhetoric. When I'm feeling low or gross, even to this day, thoughts of restricting my caloric intake and punishing myself still flood back. This idea of sharing tips to better get away with suffering by hiding it from others, preventing treatment and tricking caregivers is absolutely personified for British millennials, especially by one iconic character in particular, Cassie from Skins. Cassie was the ultimate cool, sad girl. We first meet her after she's just been discharged from treatment following a suicide attempt. There's scene after scene of her explaining how she stops people noticing her anorexia nervosa or falsifying her weight to suggest she's in recovery. And it's all delivered with a patented whimsical melancholy. She's the ultimate aspiration of young girls mired in self-loathing and suffering. Someone who's skinny and pretty and well-liked and sweet and sad and she was so obviously broken in a way that many felt on the inside. Skins was marketed as inspiration for scandalous teens, but its writing was often more of a cautionary tale. However, for many teenagers watching the show, the subtle differences were lost under the quotable eating disorder inspo and cigarette smoke. This sad gal aesthetic has only grown since the heydays of late night Channel 14 dramas, spreading online across every platform you can name. That sadness, the emptiness, the hopelessness is just one symptom of depression, and the sad girl's portrayal of mental illness is often marked 
marked and its deliberate separation from less aesthetically pleasing symptoms. Cassie was all big eyes and thin limbs, but we never saw classic anorexic symptoms appear like eroded teeth or hair loss or dry yellowish skin. In fact, I can't help but think that many of the same people reposting Canva graphics about their girlish melancholy now with Be Kind in their bios and who would absolutely have bought those suicide prevention rubber wristbands in the 2000s are also the kind of people who would look in scorn at someone whose depression had matted their hair and robbed them of their ability to wash themselves, or whose psychosis made them erratic or whose OCD bleached their hands raw. Some people claim that the sad girl side of the internet doesn't necessarily have to be linked to mental health diagnosed disorders, and that there is power and catharsis in women being able to express their emotions freely. But so many people conflate the two. The question is, what might it do to people who are genuinely suffering to see their turmoil as desirable, or conversely, to see themselves as too far gone in comparison to the clean aesthetics of palatable online discussions of depression? In 2017, a 14-year-old girl, Molly Russell, died in the UK. An inquest into her death found that she had been overwhelmed by what her father described as just the bleakest of worlds, referring to the online content she'd been consuming in the months leading up to her death. There were thousands of posts saved, liked and shared on her social media accounts, focused on suicide, self-harm and depression, including graphic videos sometimes binged one after another in long watch sessions. Her father Ian called it, a world I don't recognize. It's a ghetto of the online world that once you fall into it, the algorithm means you can't escape it and it keeps recommending more content. You can't escape it. This is a huge part of the issue. Corporations creating the landscapes that we populate online are by their nature primarily concerned with profit. They want eyeballs and they want them for as much time as they can get. These algorithms will keep feeding users content that they've engaged with, whether or not that content or engagement is healthy, helpful or desired. Outrage, anger and fear all generate clicks and the pipeline leading to violence and extremism is well documented and the same seems to hold for mental health related content too. In the context of suicide and self-harm contagion, the picture only gets more worrying. Previous studies of the phenomenon were centered around existing communities that seem to have unusually high numbers of suicides in a geographic area, and so could be studied and analyzed for potential direct connections between the deaths. However, the impact of social contagion in online spaces is nearly impossible to measure. When a high profile figure, especially one within these mental health communities, dies, the aftermath cannot be easily studied or quantified. Notes that Molly Russell left behind included quotes from the content that she'd been viewing online. In 2022, the senior coroner at North London Coroner's Court ruled that she had died from an act of self-harm or suffering from depression and the negative effects of online content. So this all seems pretty awful. Are there any positives to the aestheticization of suffering that we can find? Well, the aesthetics of humor, memes, and knowing in-jokes are an obvious way that people might write, draw, or create around the experience of mental suffering. These easily shareable moments of community have obvious appeal, helping people feel less alone. They're the ultimate conclusion of the destigmatization campaigns, telling people to just talk about it, or else a viable coping mechanism to counter darker thoughts. They are a kind of lighter form of community and acceptance by their very nature. The lines of good and bad content engaged with suffering also become blurred when you consider the generations of literary poets and artists writing about their own mental illness that have created pieces that have connected with thousands, millions around the world, allowing them to be seen and heard. A wilting of vision and creativity is itself a potential effect of many mental illnesses where your passions begin to hold little interest for you. And there are arguments that working to express yourself on what you're experiencing in artistic ways has the potential to be revelatory. Aesthetics in this way might help visualize mental suffering, acting as a form of self-care and expression. In fact, the potential of using aesthetics to treat and improve mental health is well established. Art therapy is a discipline of psychotherapy that uses art to unlock self-expression, communicate trauma, or articulate complex inner thoughts and feelings. In her essay, The Aesthetic Turn in Mental Health, Professor Rosemarie Samaretta talks about the development of art therapy. Music, dance, art and drama have been applied in therapeutic settings since the late 19th century, early 20th century, and developed into professional mental health applications after the Second World War. Situated in psychiatric hospitals, Art therapies in the early years were offered as day activities to prevent deprivation and keep patients busy throughout the day. It showed that working with the arts also had an impact on the mental, somatic, and psychological condition of the patients involved. 
However, it's important to note that not all images, graphics, and videos online that engage with the topic of mental health are synonymous with work producing art therapy. Art itself may well increase mental well-being, but licensed therapists are trained specifically in art therapy for a reason. Art therapy as a practice is not the same as just doing art. An art therapist, for example, would specifically be looking at the ways in which your particular disorder or diagnosis might work with different methods of self-expression on top of the particulars of you as an individual. As Samaritta put it, patients with personality disorders, disassociative disorders, severe depression or trauma often describe a blocked perception of bodily feelings or perception and a disturbed sense of self. A therapeutic approach that helps to develop embodied presence would therefore be a first step to develop some sense of self that then could serve as a point of reference throughout the therapy process. The process within art therapy is not one of continuous dwelling on the suffering as a source of positivity and beauty to be immortalized, but is a method through which one might be able to engage with treatment, recovery, or just finding an equilibrium of coping in the day to day. Part three, the aesthetics of awareness. When we talk about the aesthetics of mental health, we aren't just talking about the depictions and discussions around suffering. We also see examples of creating aesthetics around the mundane day-to-day -day life of someone with a mental illness, that equilibrium of coping, as it were, an awareness of what it's like to live with this disorder. We've all heard the online refrain, romanticize your life, right? This concept gained popularity during lockdown, but has endured till today, encouraging people to reframe the way that they look at their life, to find the small moments of joy, whether it's rediscovering discovering your hometown or city through the eyes of a first time visitor, dressing up in clothes that you tell yourself you're saving for a special occasion just to eat your breakfast at home, or embracing miserable rainy days by reading hardback books and cozy jumpers. Ordinary things that people do every day become aesthetic and romanticized in a way to make them feel special. Mainly attitudes to this trend see it as at worst unnecessary and at best a great way to embed mindfulness, purpose and joy into your life. So if romanticizing your day to day is so great, why does it become a problem when mentally ill people are the ones doing the aestheticizing? When do you start to live a life that you can't or aren't allowed to romanticize? What is too serious to be part of the trend? For many people, their general life and their mental illness is not this thing that they can separate out from each other. It's something that is a part of them. Might this specific type of relatable content being made to feel special be of particular importance and impact when we're looking to destigmatize? Not necessarily depicting the symptoms or moments of suffering themselves as a main focus, just the day-to-day -day of existence. Arguably, this kind of lighthearted aesthetic can also showcase genuinely useful tools that help those struggling in a more accessible way than clinical NHS websites or expensive therapy sessions. There was a trend, for example, of people bedazzling their pillboxes. Is it trivializing vital medication or making something that can be intimidating when you're first diagnosed into something less scary? Does the increased visual appeal of tips or tricks in content online make them lesser than if they were given in a plain and serious way? Surely if an increased aesthetic appeal helps boost these posts, it's just a way for advice and destigmatizing stories to reach more people. I think we're used to looking past the necessary performativity when it comes to the creation of a lot of content. We know, for example, that that shot of a creator waking up had to be set up in advance. Like she had to get up, set up the camera, go back to bed and edit it to look like she just pulled herself from her slumber. And who knows, maybe she even filmed that halfway through the day. But when it comes to something as personal, private and distrusted as experiences of mental health, that slight lack of authenticity can feel loaded. I see a lot of discussion around the idea that this very content with people sharing things like depression day in their lives might serve to make those on the most at risk or vulnerable ends of the spectrum feel even more alone. After all, being capable of conceptualizing a video, let alone filming and editing, may well be beyond many. Do we risk increasing levels of shame if some people's experiences of living with depression are entirely beyond the possibility of asceticizing. I think this all circles around questions that often arise around social media in general. There will always be posts about things that you can't afford or lifestyles that are unavailable to you or experiences that don't resonate. Couple vloggers will have relationships that don't match up to your own. Videos about people achieving something you have on your mental bucket list will turn up on your FYP. But your reaction to that, jealousy, self-doubt, frustration, sadness, that's on you. For every person who finds a video about cleaning out a mildly messy room after a few days of worsened depression motivating, there will be another who finds it upsetting that their own situation is worse. I don't necessarily think that means that we need to police any and all mental health content just in case it isn't meant for everyone. 
In fact, trying to universalize mental health can do way more harm than good. When we talk about content that's supposed to raise awareness, we often end up with generic, weak campaigns that don't dig into the specifics of different disorders or the variety of experiences. There is no one-size-fits-all depiction of mental health conditions or issues, and the more we see depictions across a spectrum of experiences, surely the better it will be for everyone. I think that this has become complicated by trends and topics which have encouraged those without mental health conditions or experiences to enter the space. Rather than a spectrum of experiences with OCD, for example, we now have a trend on TikTok where people discuss so-called intrusive thoughts, which are simply ordinary impulsive thoughts or feelings. Intrusive thoughts are awful. They can be disturbing, violent, sickening, and they are inescapable. A lot of the TikToks around intrusive thoughts are just people experiencing a momentary impulse to do something weird or silly. These posts, appropriating the terminology of mental health conditions, can further alienate those suffering with actual intrusive thoughts. In the comments, you'll see people engaging positively with the most acceptable or understandable version of these thoughts, maybe adding their own experiences. But posts that touch on genuinely taboo versions of these symptoms become a breeding ground for disgust, rejection, and an increased incidence of stigma. The nature of intrusive thoughts is that they attack your fears and values. A devoted parent becomes overwhelmed with images of killing their child. A victim of sexual assault is suddenly mired in repetitive thoughts that they themselves might be a paedophile. Someone working to end bigotry is hit over and over with bigoted thoughts that they don't believe about their friends and people on the street around them. Yet the response to many of these people's opening up is people telling them that they shouldn't have talked about it out loud in the first place at all, that they're wrong and dangerous, and that these thoughts must say something about who they really are inside. The use of the term by those referring to thoughts that aren't intrusive at all in an aesthetic video format to dramatic music has itself done a huge amount of harm. And then there's the pretty privilege of it all, right? The cute skinny white girls with pouty posing and emo tumbler makeup were the epitome of the heroin chic of the 2000s. Their very bodies and faces in black and white were enough to make a graphic aesthetic. When the face of mental health struggles day to day looks more like someone who doesn't fit that narrow demographic, particularly someone struggling with hygiene, who has matted hair or bad skin, that's often representation which is shunned. Ironically, mental illnesses or symptoms that aren't seen as possible to romanticize or asceticize will often be the people who need the most support. Part four, romanticizing recovery and treatment. Recovery inspo can take many forms. With eating disorders, recovery inspo can be sharing images of food that that person is now able to eat. With depression, recovery inspo could be a time lapse of someone cleaning their kitchen after getting out of a depression slump. One of the more popular forms of recovery inspo is a photo or video montage showing images of yourself while you're at your lowest point and then showing images of yourself now in recovery and significantly happier. While the decorating of pillboxes is about asceticizing mental health maintenance, the recovery inspo is about asceticizing progress. These visuals celebrate milestones that most people might overlook, like being able to spontaneously spontaneously order french fries or being able to go outside on a walk or finally take out your trash. While recovery can include images of suffering, they always juxtapose them with images of joy. If we acknowledge the potential social contagion elements of mental illness, it feels like it would be apt to also consider the potential social contagion of treatment and recovery too. For many people, there is a hopelessness that surrounds their suffering, and these kinds of posts are a clear source of possible hope. It also shows progress as a process, sometimes a lifelong one. For many of us, our mental health conditions will always be with us, whether it's a high risk of relapse or a long-term condition where symptoms are managed rather than cured. The asceticization of recovery feels much more useful than that of suffering in a straightforward kind of way. It could be helpful for the creator to document and narrativize their own progress. It can inspire hope for a viewer and help them celebrate their own progress. The fact that cleaning my depression room became a micro trend is a testament to the usefulness of these videos. But and, you know, I hate to say this, one of these days I'll make a video where I'm just like, this thing is nice, the end. But we love nuance here, and I think I'll be remiss not to mention some of the counterpoints that are brought up around this kind of content online, because there is a chance for this kind of content to make somebody feel worse. It feels similar to some of the criticisms of this sort of everyday mental health content that I mentioned in the previous section, but even more heightened when it's dealing with this strong contrast between the highs and lows of recovery or treatment. 
Maybe they're not yet in a place where they can even think about cleaning out their depression room or their room is so much messier than those that they see on TikTok. Maybe they've been struggling with an ED for over a decade and it hurts to see the recovery video of someone who's had a much shorter journey than them. Or maybe the recovery inspo for one mental illness is triggering for another. For example, for someone with binge eating disorder, progress can look like eating smaller portions. It would make sense for them to document that part of their recovery. However, if you have anorexia and you're scrolling through the ED recovery inspo tag, you can see a video celebrating eating less and that itself might be triggering. Recovery can also look very different for the same mental illness. Maybe your recovery looks like hiking and going to brunch with friends. And for others, it looks like binging Gilmore Girls with their caretaker after receiving electroconvulsive therapy. The only authorities on what your recovery should look like are you alongside those collaborating on your care, like your doctor or therapist, which is a tricky one because recovery videos tend to leave out many aspects of treatment. They rarely show a trip to the doctor's office in all its bland clinical glory, for example. Showing recovery without displaying the tools needed can be very misleading. It's a before and after shot where the methodology to get there is downplayed. But while it feels important to be open about the help received, the creators of Recovery Inspo are not responsible for every person's reaction to their content. We all see content online that isn't for us, that doesn't serve us, that doesn't resonate. And content about mental health is a heightened version of this. As such, it takes more education and awareness for people to be able to filter through what will be helpful or harmful to them. And it can be difficult to make those decisions at your lowest, especially when our brains love to chase personal misery and punishment so much in that state. But that isn't the fault of the creators simply expressing their thoughts, experiences, or feelings online. Part five, the real problem. A majority of commentary around this topic seems to tend towards the disapproving. Aesthetic mental health content and attitudes are glorifying and romanticizing, they trivialize and increase stigma. But there is potential good here. Mental health struggles by their nature can be extremely isolating. They're feelings that exist inside your own mind, often invisible to others around you until they rise in severity or can't be contained. When we allow people to create imagery around their internal experiences, a sense of community can grow. When we give people permission to connect their struggles with aesthetics, whether it be something visually beautiful or an in-group sense of humor or relatable lines of poetry, a community can form. Feeling empathized with is wonderful, of course, but truly feeling understood is even more powerful. A feeling of a true lack of judgment, of being able to express yourself and your experiences no matter how dark or frightening. Many people are dealing with issues directly related to the reality of the world around us. There have been this emphasis on the idea that anyone can struggle with their mental health, even people who seem to have it all, but that emphasis can erase the reality that a lack of material and financial stability is a clear exacerbator of mental health struggles, that marginalized people often have higher rates of mental health issues. If you live in a world where these overarching structures of class inequality or white supremacy or patriarchy exist, it's the sad girl movement, not just an opportunity for girls and women to cathart together. We see accounts like Sad Girls Club, aimed specifically at helping women of color with mental illness by providing them with a community, direct this impulse in a deliberate and considered way. Elise Fox, founder of the club, explained, Today, sad girls have reclaimed the name and use it as a place of acceptance and familiarity, owning their mental woes and creating community. There have been a lot of criticisms about a kind of commercialization of the aesthetics of mental health, right? People selling merch, t-shirts, hats, pin badges around their mental illnesses and their experiences. And I can understand how people can feel cynical about this, but I think at the root, people aren't wanting to buy these because they're just blinded by capitalist greed. I think it's because it says something that resonates with them. And there's this opportunity to express those feelings out in the world, hopefully making someone else feel less alone or making them feel more confident in what they are feeling. But I think that to suggest that this type of content is only ever a force for good perhaps lies in the realm of the eternal naive optimist. For every safe space created, a toxic one springs up alongside. Community can help you feel supported, but if the community you find is a pro-eating disorder one instead of a recovery-based one, that can turn against you. The ideas of community and self-expression are the foundation of existing treatments and tools like support groups and art therapy when done well, but out of the hands of professionals, you might be just as likely to cause harm than good. 
therapists are trained in dealing with the extreme ends of mental health spectrums, to be non-judgmental, to leave aside their biases, and even they get it wrong sometimes. Ultimately, like so many things in the world, this isn't a topic with clear absolutes. Cornell professor Janice Whitlock has commented on this online phenomenon. The answer of whether or not it does more harm than good depends on who's reading it and what their personal filters for perception are. Is that online feeling of support too fleeting? Does it lead to significant changes in offline behaviour that help people get better? Are they more likely to go to therapy? I don't know. But what happens next is a hugely important question. I agree to an extent with this, but I think it misses a crucial piece of the puzzle. The sense in this quote is that this online world is part of the first step in a process of treatment and recovery, that its use is a gateway to next steps. But we need to look at the reality of mental health care and ask, what next steps? Years long waiting lists or to get 10 sessions of therapy that do next to nothing for you? Going into debt to afford inpatient treatment at a clinic? Being unable to afford medication when your health insurance doesn't cover your pre-existing mental health condition? A 2021 study by the NHS found that one in six young people aged six to 16 were likely to have mental health issues, a major increase from the previous study in 2017. 70% of LGBTQIA youth report persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. Meanwhile, the waiting lists to receive health on the NHS are longer than ever. As of last August, 1.6 million people were on the official waiting list for mental health services, and those are only the people who managed to get through to be qualified to be on the list. So of course, people are going to seek out help on social media because where else can they go? It doesn't feel unreasonable to suggest that a lack of resources might manifest in these aestheticized posts and romanticized imagery because what else do people have to help them in a material way? In an interview with Refinery29, one 25-year-old woman describes her relationship to therapy accounts on Instagram. It serves as a series of quotes and reminders to keep me in check when it comes to my feelings and emotions. I've spoken with my GP several times regarding my mental health recently. I was put on a waiting list for CBT, which I gave up on. And I think this is a key cornerstone of the entire discussion, because perhaps people are not turning to romanticization or aesthetically pleasing imagery because they are vapid and shallow and naive, but because they are figuring out ways to cope without accessible and comprehensive mental health care. I think a lot of the time when the aestheticization of mental health is brought up, the kind of questions that people ask are very narrowed to that topic. The idea of, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is it helpful or harmful? when really looking at this wider picture feels so important. When I talked at the beginning of the video about the idea that mental health was less visible outwardly than physical health until it got to a crisis point, it feels like this trend of aestheticizing mental health is the visual crisis point. Like that is what we are seeing. And behind it are all of these issues that are underneath the surface that need to be addressed before we look to address this little crisis point that we're visualizing right here on social media, online or elsewhere, right? And it isn't even enough to go back just one step further and say, okay, well, we have to deal with mental health care because of course we do. We need to deal with the affordability of mental health care, the accessibility of it, the training, all of those things. But we also kind of have to go back further and look at the fact that although some people have genetic mental health conditions, which would potentially come up and manifest within them, regardless of their circumstances, people's circumstances are also having an effect. Increasing education around how to help maintain a healthy level of mental health is great. In the same way, it's great to explain to people how to maintain a healthy physical health. And the more that we have that education, the more that it can be tailored, not just to one specific catch-all version of that, but for particular people, you know, lots of different versions of what that looks like, lots of different options for people. But at some point we're gonna hit a barrier and the barrier is people's like, material experiences in the world, which are gonna be contributing to this ill health. Yes, destigmatizing is important, especially when it comes to those areas of mental health, which are more taboo and still are today. However, we also need to be looking at the ways in which inequality of all kinds is impacting this. We need to talk about young people's feelings about the future, the impact of the climate crisis, on people's mental health. There are so many things that are going on in the world where if you take a step back and look at it, it feels kind of inevitable that people are not feeling great. And then when we then add the context of a capitalist system, which means that people are encouraged to strive for productivity and are pushed into levels of burnout rather than feeling safe within their employment, to take time off, with feeling safe in disclosing any struggles that they're having, 
to their employer, that's only gonna make things worse. I have a number of mental health conditions myself and I'm readying myself for the inevitable upcoming flare up of seasonal affective disorder, appropriately shortened to SAD. It comes around for me every autumn and winter with various symptoms, but I am always mired with fatigue. I can be low and exhausted for months at a time. My usual anxiety and depression medication doesn't help. I just have to figure out ways to cope. And last year I found something that helped just a little. I romanticized. I lent into the aesthetics of the season. Where the miserably short and dark days would typically fill me with dread, I tried to look at the moments of pleasure that I might find in them if I was feeling well enough to. And I was able to do this because of the job that I have. Because I'm working as a freelancer who's able to choose my own hours and I'm not locked into an office job where they value this kind of overarching corporate structure over the well-being of their employees and what they might need. I was able to do my work at particular times of day when I knew that my fatigue was going to be less. I was able to strategize to mean that high impact projects could happen in those months where I wasn't feeling like this. I made a list complete with illustrations of things to do when the darkness descended and I could accomplish little else except sleep. Rather than try to push through and work myself into burnout or erase the presence of the wintry months, I tried to embrace them, switching the lights off and lighting lamps and candles, making a hot spice apple juice, snuggling up with a hot water bottle and a blanket. I created a menu of vibes, an optional to-do list of aesthetic activities. And it fucking worked. Obviously it didn't get rid of my sad by any stretch of the imagination, but I felt just a little less dread around these hours of exhaustion. It wasn't that I just had to try to be less sad or cheer up already, but being able to send a photo of my hot cocoa to a group chat with friends who knew I was struggling and get their supportive messages back felt infinitely better than saying nothing or battling tirelessly to make artificial lights replicate the sunlight that my body was craving, telling myself that I was only gonna be happy once the real sun was back. When you're going through these things, as so many of us will in our lives, we don't need awareness posts to tell us that it sucks. We know, we are painfully aware. We figure out ways to cope and find joy and share and be in community while in the middle of the darkness. And that's what I see in the best of so-called aesthetic mental health graphics and videos, which give us different ways to frame these experiences that feel so inescapable and bleak, because sometimes that's exactly what we need. Mm -hmm.